hope you can hear me. Uh, good afternoon. I want to welcome our panelists and thank my colleague and co-chair of the Congressional Energy and National Security Caucus, Congressman Rooney, for joining me today to call attention to emerging threats that may result in the rapid changes taking place in the Arctic region. The Arctic has long been considered a remote, frozen region, but rapidly changing conditions are exposing previously inaccessible, inaccessible areas. The Arctic is warming at double the rate of the rest of the world. Ice-free summers are projected within decades, and the melting sea ice is opening the region to commerce, transport, and resource extraction, bringing new opportunities, but also new dangers. Although there continues to be significant international cooperation when it comes to the Arctic, the region is increasingly viewed as an arena for competition amongst the United States, Russia, and China. Russia has enhanced its military presence and operates in the Arctic. China has outlined plans to develop a polar silk road and signaled its intention to play a more active role in Arctic governance. These actions have only reinforced our need to increase cooperative partnership in the Arctic. The deterioration of ice in the Arctic has led to increased calls for oil and gas exploration. Finding and developing Arctic oil, however, are difficult and costly efforts. Also, the ability to respond to a disastrous spill in the Arctic is extremely limited. Cleanup is substantially more challenging in treacherous freezing cold waters than in areas surrounding the Exxon Valdez spill in Prince William Sound or the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, and those catastrophes were challenging enough. Effective response strategies currently do not exist. Climate change in the Arctic is also expected to affect the economies, health, and cultures of Arctic indigenous peoples. The large commercial fisheries are under threat by changes to the ocean, soil, and air temperatures. The future of U.S. policy for the Arctic is an important topic, so I look forward to learning about the energy, security, environment, and geopolitics of the emerging Arctic region from our panelists today. First, we have Dr. Victoria Herman, who is the Managing Director of the Arctic Institute and an Assistant Research Professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Dr. Herman currently serves as the principal investigator of the National Science Foundation funded Arctic Migration in Harmony, an interdisciplinary network on littoral species, settlements, and cultures on the moon. Dr. Daly Sambo Doro is the international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, a non governmental organization that represents approximately 100. 80,000 Inuit from the Russian Far East, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. She serves as the co-chair of the International Law Association Committee on Implementation of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Dr. Elizabeth Buchanan is Lecturer of Strategic Studies at Deakin University with the One Star and Above Rank Defense and Strategic Studies course, DSSC which is given at the Australian War College. She's a fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point Military Academy. She is the co-managing editor of the Institute for Regional Securities Security Challenges Journal, Australia's sole academic journal for the study of future security issues. Michael McElhenney serves as the Senior Policy Advisor for Arctic Issues in the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of international affairs. He coordinated the first senior DOE visits to Iceland and Greenland and assisted in the planning and creation of interagency Arctic policy. Prior to his service in the Department of Energy, he served as a policy, policy and strategy analyst for the Under Secretary of the Navy with responsibility for Arctic and nuclear issues. Frederick Jonsson holds the title of Minister Counselor within Iceland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and serves as Iceland's senior Arctic official to the Arctic Council. Prior to his current position, he served as Iceland's representative to NATO's military committee and as first secretary and defense counselor at the Embassy of Iceland in Washington, D.C. 
I'll now recognize each of our panelists for opening remarks, starting with Dr. Herman. Thank you, Chairman Engel, distinguished members of the committee, my fellow Arctic colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon to listen, to discuss, and ultimately to learn how we can work together to address the widening security threats to the 4 million people that call the Arctic home. Over the past six months, we have all experienced a rapid transition into a new, more dangerous normal. COVID-19 has redefined how we calculate risk to our health, to our very lives on a daily basis. We now assess the safety of going grocery shopping or of hugging our loved ones. Humans are resilient. We have adapted, but not without sacrifice and immense loss. COVID-19 has shown each of us what living in a new, more dangerous normal is like, and what it takes to operate securely in a time of enormous uncertainty. It's given us just a glimpse of what it is like to live in a climate-changed Arctic, where residents calculate climate risk daily, not in some far off future, but now in 2020, as we speak this afternoon. If there is one takeaway message from my briefing, it is this. The Arctic has entered a new, more dangerous normal, and this country is not prepared to operate securely or to lead within it. For America's northernmost citizens, for the world's northernmost residents, climate change is already an everyday, life-threatening reality. It is incumbent upon those here today to safeguard American lives and to become an Arctic nation that leads not follows in a rapidly changing region. The US is often described as a reluctant Arctic nation with inadequate investment in Arctic leadership in the federal government, a lack of sustained funding for resilient civilian and military infrastructure, and little strategic vision for the region's future, the US lags every other Arctic state. For the US to lead in the Arctic requires three considerations. What is needed for Arctic residents to adapt to this new normal? How to equip Arctic energy systems to handle 21st century economic and climactic shocks? And whose voices are needed to bolster courageous U.S. Arctic leadership? First, the United States needs to invest in the infrastructure and tools Arctic residents need to survive a new climate changed reality. This summer was a season of extremes in the Arctic. In June, the Russian Arctic reached 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, the highest temperature in the Arctic since record keeping began. Such heat has melted sea ice and made traditional hunting and fishing more perilous for skilled indigenous hunters. It's fueled costly wildfires, some of which are so strong they now last from one summer to the next. These zombie fires destroy homes, ecosystems, and children's health. And climate impacts have sped up permafrost thaw, buckling roads, causing oil spills, and displacing entire communities. The United States can lead the region by investing in flexible, community-driven adaptation strategies like those detailed in the Fourth National Climate Assessment, and resilient infrastructure capable of withstanding climate disasters and mitigating costs. Second, the U.S. needs a forward-thinking vision for an equitable, low-carbon energy economy in the Arctic that is led by American ingenuity. American scientists, engineers, indigenous leaders, and government initiatives like the Sandia National Laboratories have pioneered expertise in remote energy technologies and microgrids in Alaska. Instead of providing federal funding and policy to support Arctic oil and gas development that delivers a poor return on investment, causes further climate destabilization, and leads to energy insecurity and fuel poverty for American citizens in Alaska that rely on diesel, the United States can lead a just economic transition for the Arctic by capitalizing on our cold climate energy expertise 
as an export for low carbon Arctic energy systems for the 21st century that can be adapted across the world. And third, we need to appoint US Arctic leaders to coordinate policy who not only understand Arctic specific challenges like thawing permafrost and sea ice melt, but can also lead regional cooperation amidst these increasingly common climate disasters. Such seasoned Arctic leaders already exist in the many well-qualified Alaska Native diplomats who serve in indigenous people's organizations, like Dr. Durow here today. These leaders already represent U.S. citizens in the Arctic Council and other negotiations, understand the gravity of climate impacts, and make informed policy decisions based on nuanced, localized knowledge that comes from living in the Arctic. After COVID-19, we will leave our new normal, but Arctic residents will continue to live in a dangerous state of emergency. The United States needs to act ambitiously, lead an economic just transition, and become a true Arctic nation with indigenous experts as part of our senior Arctic representation. Climate change cannot be stopped. The Arctic's ice will melt and large swaths of frozen ground will thaw but we can work today to avert the worst damage and adapt to the impacts we can no longer avoid. The cost of inaction is too high, not just for the Arctic, but for every state and territory in our union. From catalyzing more frequent hurricanes in the Gulf to intensifying wildfires in the West, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, it affects us all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me now uh, call on Dr. Daly Sambo Doro. Thank you very much, Chairman Engel. Um, essentially, in this uh, brief set of remarks, I have three messages. Um, all of the issues uh, that have been noted in this particular briefing, energy, security, environment, and geopolitics, all of them are interrelated and indivisible. So from an Inuit perspective, uh, all of these issues uh, must be treated in a holistic fashion. The second message is that, as Dr. Herman has just noted, Inuit, are Arctic Indigenous peoples, and we put the human face on all Arctic issues. And if we consider these matters in a holistic fashion, we need to be engaged directly in every dialogue and discussion because it's going to impact us as the original inhabitants of the Arctic region. Inuit occupy, at least in terms of the traditional territories of Inuit, just over 40% of the Arctic region, spanning from Chukotka and the Russian Far East throughout Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. So our role and what we have to offer, not only to the United States, but to the world community, is an extraordinary wealth of knowledge about this unique and distinct region. It is difficult to uh, address anything related to uh, the Arctic or any world or global issue without mentioning COVID-19 and the current pandemic that we face. From the Inuit perspective, we've issued a number of different press releases that underscore the pre-existing infrastructure deficit that's been alluded to by Dr. Herman. But in the face of an epidemic, in the face of a pandemic, this infrastructure deficit that we have faced for decades needs to be closed. This gap uh, needs to be closed. So allow me just to do a brief introduction of the Inuit Circumpolar Council and uh, reinforce some of my messages with a number of comments. The Inuit Circumpolar Council was organized in June of 1977, and it was the foresight of uh, elder statesman Eben Hobson, who's recognized as the founder of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. 
He gathered Inuit, all of our blood relations across the national borders to organize the Inuit Circumpolar Council. In June of 1977, when he welcomed Inuit delegates from across the Circumpolar Arctic, he stated that our language contains the memory of 4,000 years of human survival through the conservation and good managing of our Arctic wealth that our language contains the intricate knowledge of the ice that we have seen no others demonstrate. And without our central involvement, there can be no safe and responsible Arctic development. These are really powerful words. And the organization, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, has not strayed from this mission, this objective to find coherence and coordination in terms of all of the issues that face us as distinct Arctic indigenous peoples. When I make reference to the need to engage Inuit directly in all the matters that are presently impacting the Arctic and specifically impacting us as the original inhabitants of the regions, it is important to recognize that we have pre-existing collective and individual human rights, and that we have experienced colonization. However, we've also, and thank you, Dr. Herman, for your comments uh, about the extraordinary leadership that has been shown through the diplomacy, through Inuit diplomacy, uh, in order to advocate for our rights. And that's been done in the context of the political right of self-determination as distinct peoples. It's also important to recognize that we have a profound relationship to our lands, territories, and environment, including the coastal seas and the oceans. And this is a quite significant issue when we talk about energy, geopolitics, uh, the environment, and obviously the important and urgent matter of climate change. We also carry with us this holistic worldview, again, that everything is interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible. And so therefore, it's important to consider all of these issues and the potential impact in one area and how it then has spin-off effects in all other areas. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, adopted by the UN General Assembly on September 13, 2007, provides important international human rights norms that the United States and every other Arctic state and every other UN member state across the globe should be adhering to. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples affirms a comprehensive set of human rights norms that we believe have extraordinary legal effects. And when one considers all of the issues facing the Arctic, they must do so against the backdrop of the rights affirmed in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, including our right to participate directly in matters that affect us. Hence, our active participation in the work of the Arctic Council as a permanent participant, as one of the original permanent participants. I also want to underscore that throughout the history of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, we have made Arctic policy a central feature. In fact, it is safe to say that long before all of the other uh, Arctic-related activity uh, that's taking place, and even before the Arctic Environmental Protection, Protection Strategy initiated by the government of Finland, which then evolved into the Arctic Council, the Inuit Circumpolar Council was pulling together comprehensive principles and elements for an Arctic policy. And it is a comprehensive set of guidelines that we believe remain relevant today. The activities that we've undertaken through the Arctic Council 
have been galvanized in the form of the Ukiavik Declaration, which was adopted by Inuit delegates in July of 2018 at our last General Assembly. And the major headings uh, of that declaration include the advancement of indigenous human rights, the critical issue of food security, the issues facing our families and youth, the overarching matter of health and wellness. And in the context of this current pandemic, you can imagine uh, the importance of this uh, theme. Also education and language, the significance of indigenous knowledge, sustainable wildlife management, environmental issues, sustainable development, as well as increasing our own communications and capacity building so that we can advance our views and perspectives at every table that is relevant to us. Of course, the impacts of climate change are highly significant. Some of this has already been addressed by Dr. Herman, the changing ice conditions, the disappearance of sea ice, coastal erosion, and the impending relocation of many of our communities. The greater risks in unknown and fast changing conditions has directly impacted our food security, creating food insecurity. So when we talk about security, we should do so not only in the context of militarization and defense, but understand that it has multiple elements, including food insecurity. Of course, we are going to face impacts of Arctic shipping. A majority of them are adverse impacts, though there may be some uh, upsides to the changing conditions from an Inuit perspective, many of the impacts of uh, increased vessel traffic are, are going to be adverse and they range from vessel noise and disruption to interference with marine mammal habitat, invasive species, also uh, vessel collisions or accidents that our communities are unprepared for. In fact, and Dr. Herman spoke of this uh, in terms of infrastructure deficits, what if a major accident takes place? The United States is not ready. In fact, probably the, the first responders are going to be the search and rescue individuals of the North Slope Borough, uh, the largest municipal government in the United States that has little in the way of the hardware needed for any kind of uh, future, future or potential accident. Of course, geopolitics, we are now acutely aware of the, the, the threats that exist in terms of the increasing and ever present interest in our homelands and the resources across the Arctic region. We are acutely aware of the potential for a triggering effect in any context in any part of the world that will then have consequences for us in the Arctic and our communities. So in terms of our need for uh, thinking strategically about to safe, the, the safeguarding of our communities, we're ever watchful. Doctor? Yes? Um, i ask you to sum up in one minute because yep. we have other and, and other people want to ask questions. So yes, please. absolutely. So my my key message is that all of these issues impact our food security, our environmental security, our economic security, and our cultural security, and overall our cultural integrity as distinct indigenous peoples. And really it is our uh, desire to ensure that we have a seat at the table in all of these discussions at the national level as well as the international level. That is the objective of the Inuit. Priyana, thank you. And I look forward to the dialogue and the questions. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate your remarks very much. Now I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Elizabeth Buchanan. Thank you, Chairman Engel, for the opportunity. Um, I want to make three main points regarding the key assumptions of the China-Russia relationship in the Arctic, so shifting to geopolitics. Um, first of all, the assumption that there is a China-Russia alliance in the Arctic. So this notion is Beijing and Moscow are an emerging axis in the Arctic, 
Um, the increased commercial engagement between Russia and China has foreshadowed an idea that the two are aligning in strategic plans for the region. I think this is a problematic assumption for the following reasons. Russia was one of the hardest Arctic Council permanent members to convince to grant China observer status. Um, it only okayed uh, China coming on board once it articulated uh, its commitment to UNCLOS and the sovereign rights and claims of the Arctic states. My research indicates mutual distrust, historical 15th century territorial tensions um, over the Far East, and issues stemming from the Sino-Soviet split of the Cold War continue to shape strategic outlook for the bilateral relationship. Both have learnt you don't have allies or partners, you have mutually beneficial relationships. So mutually beneficial arrangements is how both assess and approach their bilateral relationship in the Arctic. In the Arctic, for Russia, since 2014, Western sanctions Russia needs the capital injections, um, has a cash flow problem, and technology for offshore Arctic exploration and production has been something China stepped in to provide. China is driven by energy insecurity. It is king at diversification, importing the energy globally, um, and the Arctic energy pool is but one more diversification pivot. China is driven by potential trade routes of the Northern Sea Route, shorter transportation between Asia and Europe, which equals savings to fuel and time and the commercial bottom line. China is driven by food insecurity, fisheries of the Arctic Ocean are a strategic resource. China is also driven by great power ideology and the greatness afforded by having a global polar footprint, both in terms of capability and capacity, which we know it has now with an indigenous icebreaker building capability. Russia is a legitimate Arctic stakeholder. Basics of geography void any ideological clash it has with any neighbours. Moscow is the largest Arctic player. We often talk about the 2008 US Geological Survey, um, which sort of indicated the hydrocarbons are amassed in the Russian Arctic zone. So we know roughly 80% of hydrocarbon resources uh, fall within the Arctic zone for Russia. Um, what I think we miss is that, you know, this is two thirds of all of Russia's energy wealth falls above the Arctic Circle. So you're looking at 25% of the Russian GDP in a strategic kind of commodity sense. Um, Russian Arctic resources have a national security, um, national economic stability and future outlook implication. And they're treated as such. Russian Arctic strategy is economic security and frontier border security all in one. Vast open borders, increasingly they're active, um, and this is playing into the Russian historical siege mentality, and this is what we're seeing in terms of the militarization response. Russian strategy is driven by national pride and history as well, conquering the fierce um, Arctic frontier. China is actively engaging Nordic and Canadian commercial ventures and is rather entrenched in terms of soft power strategy for the region, well beyond Russia. Russia has not provided any special treatment to China in the use of the Northern Sea Route. Chinese vessels have been refused entry, and those that pass must abide by a Russian transit law, domestic laws. Um, they're piloted vessels by Moscow, and tolls are paid. There's also pre-warning of any planned usage. A second notion I wanted to unpack in my brief remarks is that Russia has an expansionist agenda in the Arctic. So this stems from apparent military modernization. Security agencies from Moscow are now populating much of the policy planning um, and public affairs stunts like planting a Russian flag on the seabed of the North Pole. I think there are some fundamental flaws with this, uh, with this assumption. Understanding the domestic drivers of Russian Arctic strategy is something I work on. And I would argue Russia is not expansionist in the Arctic in the traditional sense. Notwithstanding evident modernization of capabilities along the Russian Arctic zone, if we peel back the posturing, stability for regional cooperation and an arena void of conflict is of the utmost significance to Russian economic strategy. 
Russia needs to be able to use the northern frontier, the northern sea route, to export to Asian energy climate clients. Doctor, can I ask you to please sum up in the, in the last minute and submit the rest of your testimony for the record? We have some, some members here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if there's one takeaway point, um, it's there's unprecedented um, Arctic industrialization underway in the Russian Arctic. Um, and this industrialization, driven by sort of energy objectives, will, I think, power the geopolitical climate going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your remarks. Uh, now, um, our panelist, Michael McElhenney. Thank you, Chairman Em. Uh, thank you, Chairman Engel, members of Congress, and the Wallace Institute for organizing this event. I also want to thank the previous speakers on the panel. Um, I'd like to begin my re my remarks by noting that the views expressed are mine alone and do not necessarily represent those of the United States government or any of its agencies. Thank you. Um, so, Arctic policy and energy. Uh, policy guidance. The national strategy for the Arctic region, region issued in 2013, is still the guiding policy document for the United States in the Arctic region. It recognizes the fundamental rights of the United States as an Arctic nation, and it desires a peaceful, cooperative Arctic that benefits all of its residents consistent with the Ottawa Declaration that established the Arctic Council in 1996. However, since 2013, we have entered a new era of new dangers, as several of our panelists have expressed. Uh, since 2013, global security challenges have increased and are not limited to, but include the Russian occupation of Crimea, intervention in Syria, and Chinese communist land grabs in the South China Sea. Russia has attempted, as Dr. Buchanan mentioned, to establish the Northern Sea Route as an internal route inconsistent with the law of the sea. Chinese institutions have aggressively sought to claim a fictitious near-Arctic status inconsistent with the letter and spirit of the Ottawa Declaration while persecuting indigenous people within their own country. And the national security strategy of 2017 recognize the parent U.S. goals recognizes paramount U.S. goals of energy independence and freedom for the United States and its allies and partners from energy coercion. The U.S. Department of Energy interprets the guidance as an all of the above energy portfolio, incorporating renewable, fossil, nuclear, and other advantages to lead decisions to communities and markets. Within the United States Arctic, northern, Alaska, northern and western Alaska, this means providing communities and industries with appropriate, scalable, and affordable options driven by their own needs, ensuring existing and planned energy facilities in the Arctic are secure and resilient, prior speakers, and allowing safe, environmentally responsible access to energy supplies necessary for anywhere in the United States. Since 2017, the Department of Energy has committed to leadership in Arctic engagement in consistent with the national security strategy and the Ottawa Declaration. Hosting the first ever National Laboratory Day in Alaska to bring the full scope of the DOE laboratory system to bear on Arctic challenges. Establishing the Arctic Lab Partnerships uh, Consortium with the University of Alaska Fairbanks to create an integral Arctic research facility within the Department of Energy. Conducting the first ever uh, Secretary of Energy speech to the Arctic Circle Assembly in Iceland in 2019. Bringing, as mentioned by previous speaker, the Cold Climate Housing Research Center in Fairbanks within the National Renewable Energy Lab of the Department of Energy to enable more direct aid and study with, for, and by indigenous communities within the Arctic to, because of the nexus between housing challenges, energy challenges, and resilience challenges, and sponsoring the United States senior Arctic official, the U.S. portion of the Arctic Renewable Energy Network Alumni, or ARENA, program to bring Arctic community energy leaders together from across the Arctic, all of the eight Arctic states, to learn how to better incorporate renewable energy into their own communities. Now, I want to speak very briefly on ice lining, um, which is a term, a new term, but as Panelists know several major global financial institutions have announced they will no longer fund fossil energy or resource development projects in the Arctic. Similar in effect, if not an intent, to previous blanket bans on finance due to geography. Well, each project 
ever proposed must stand on their own merits. Blanket refusals are inappropriate and harmful for multiple reasons. One, they disproportionately impact indigenous peoples who would often own and or operate the facilities to be discussed, as well as benefit from their tax, from their tax resources and infrastructure improvements. Two, it leaves the door open to financial exploitation from CCP or other bad actors. And three, it de facto rewards Russia's existing investments and financial partners in the Arctic, surely the opposite of any intended policy. So in the future, uh, recognition of the United States as Arctic states, as an Arctic state within the whole of government and across the region will continue, as previously mentioned. The recently issued presidential memorandum on polar ice breaking um, is the capstone on decades of concern over declining U.S. polar access and will surely lead to results in the near to medium future. Um, as previously discussed, Russia's bet the country investment on Arctic oil and gas military facilities to defend these investments is likely to continue and, in fact, is a rational response um, to having 20 percent or more of your economy in one basket. And finally, CCP, uh, Chinese Communist Party, economic and maritime penetration attempts will continue, but with growing recognition of its dangers among the other Arctic states and peoples. Uh, so with that, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And our, our, our last um, remarks will come from uh, Frederick Johnson. Yes, good afternoon, Washington, uh, Chairman Engel, distinguished committee members and others. Uh, thank you for inviting me and I hope you hear me OK here from uh, from Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, as you probably all know, the uh, we have the uh, current chairmanship of the Arctic Council and I will uh, briefly just make uh, remarks on uh, the pandemic's effect on the work of the Council and then discuss briefly uh, China and Russia. Now, of course, we have been impacted, uh, our chairmanship program. Uh, we've had to cancel or postpone a number of events. Uh, but I would like to stress that the core work of the Council uh, performed through its working groups has continued unabated, uh, which reflects the uh, built-in resilience and flexibility of the construct of the Council, uh, where practical work has long continued using remote collaboration, VTCs and the like, in order to coordinate along, across long distances and multiple time zones. Uh, the executive part of the Council's work has moved primarily online, uh, with senior Arctic officials meeting through web-based platforms to move the work of the Council forward. And I'd like to use this opportunity to point all of you to a document released this summer by, uh, by the Council, uh, which was a, prepared as a briefing document to senior Arctic officials on, uh, on COVID. Uh, and it provides a good snapshot of how it has impacted the region and what mitigation and protection strategies have been implemented. Uh, and that also demonstrates the flexibility and convening power of the Council um, when it comes to sharing knowledge and experiences, even concurrent to an ongoing crisis. And as I've reflected in the document, it highlights the value of enhancing international collaborations to support research and policy actions for current and future pandemic realities, and the necessity of ensuring that Arctic peoples lead efforts to define and respond to their communities' needs be that in emergency response, relief measures, health and social care and infrastructure. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, move to the geopolitics of the region. Uh, we are uh, now starting to prepare uh, in the Council for the um, Arctic Council Ministerial in the spring, in May, uh, which will mark off the, the end of the Icelandic chairmanship and then uh, mark also the beginning of the Russian chairmanship. And also, by the way, coincides with the 25th anniversary of the Arctic Council. And as you know, you've already been touched upon here, there's much discussion about the Arctic as a potential future zone of great power competition. I would argue that as in the past, it is in everyone's interest that the Arctic continues to be a region of peace, stability and constructive cooperation. For that, all parties involved, in particular the eight Arctic states, are with and with them in the lead, uh, must work well together and share that goal. And although the Arctic Council is not a legal construct, international law plays a vital role in Arctic governance, in particular the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. We may have individual disagreements on policy points, but we all ultimately share the goal of peaceful, prosperous and healthy Arctic. And I'd like to stress, as many of our political leaders have done, that the fact that the Arctic is currently a low tension area is a result of a conscious effort by the governments of the Arctic states. So far, 
we have not let tension and stress elsewhere affect our cooperation in the Arctic. If that changes, there is much more to lose than gain. And two main points of contention are usually brought forward in this context, China and the increased militarization of the Arctic by, in particular, Russia. Now, China's recent uh, increased interest in the Arctic uh, is, uh, has several drivers, as has been mentioned already. Uh, climate and science, access to resources, and the potential opening up of the uh, transpolar shipping routes that gives access to trade, transport, and resources. On both issues, China has an opportunity to be a positive partner and player to the region and to the Arctic states. And in practical terms, we see no real indications of China wanting to be anything else. They are a valued observer in the Arctic Council and as such have undertaken certain commitments including to respect sovereign interests of the Arctic states, as well as the primacy of international law, including UN conventional law of the sea, when it comes to the Arctic. And they have contributed to some of the Council's working group. And I will argue that the recent reference of China to itself as a near Arctic state was a poor choice of phrase that brought forward unhelpful connotations that could be interpreted as a challenge to the primacy of the sovereignty of the Arctic states in Arctic affairs. Much like post-Soviet verbias on Russia's near abroad has been used as an excuse by Russia to meddle in internal affairs of its neighboring states. Again, in practice and so far, China has proven to be fairly benign and constructive. And I would note that in the light of the Arctic aid universally rejecting their claim to fame, fame as a near Arctic state, they seem to have quietly dropped it from their uh, vocabulary choosing to rather refer to themselves as Arctic stakeholders. This is important for a great power like China, how it conducts itself on the international stage is of paramount interest, not just to its immediate neighbors, but to us as well in the region with whom it seeks to trade and pursue cooperation. China has no territorial claims in the Arctic. It has, again, interests that primarily relate to issues uh, pertaining to freedom of movement and navigation, guaranteed to it by international law, and in that all our interests should coincide, coincide whether Arctic or non-Arctic. With regards to Russian militarization of the Arctic, uh, we have to tread a bit carefully and try to delineate between legitimate Russian security interests uh, in the Arctic, including in particular relating to the opening up of the Northeast Passage and increased access to subsurface resources in their own territorial waters, versus concerns we have uh, related to offensive capabilities, bastion defense, and anti-access area denial in the high north. Again, there is a conscious effort by all the governments of the Arctic aid to try and keep the Arctic as a low tension area and not let friction in other regions of the world impact our cooperation. And this is why the good work of the Arctic Council has been able to continue after 2014. Can I, can I ask um, to, to sum up the rest of your... Of your yep, I'm al almost done. So, uh, but this doesn't mean we're, we're either immune or unaware of what goes on elsewhere. Uh, we are, in fact, keenly aware that it is a delicate balance to be struck. And, uh, and that's how we continue. Uh, the challenge here and so far is that for us to be able to talk about security with the Russians, we cannot uh, do any signaling that can be interpreted as either normalization or legitimization with regards to Russia's action in eastern Ukraine in general and the annexation of Crimea in particular. And therein lies the challenge uh, for us to talk security with, with Russia in the Arctic context. Um, and that's it for me for, for now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would just, before I, I turn this over to Mr. Sherman, I want to um, ask you a, a quick question. Uh, and that is, um, in, your, in your view, do the Trump administration's views on climate change affect U.S. Uh, discussions with the other Arctic states over the region's future? Uh, it's, it, it, there was at the uh, last ministerial in Rovaniemi in, uh, in, uh, in Finland, at the end of the Finnish chairmanship and uh, prior to ours, uh, there were points of contention with regards to uh, um, reference to climate change in the ministerial statement. Uh, and, uh, but I think since then, in practical terms, it hasn't uh, really impacted as much because the, 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 um, the work of the Council is very much focused on practicalities. 
So in the global political sense, people can argue about the causes of climate change, but in the Arctic, you can't argue about the impact of climate change in the region. So, uh, so we've been uh, so with that debate in in the practicalities of the uh, uh, within the Arctic Council, we've been able to move beyond those uh, uh, deliberations and continue the work. Thank you very much. Um, we uh, certainly uh, appreciate uh, everyone's uh, very uh, good testimony, and um, we are uh, we will absolutely. Um, hear what we say and, uh, and, and, and act upon it. Um, let me call a uh, colleague of mine who's been very patient today, uh, Mr. Sherman of California. Is it my turn or is it uh, Mr. Shabbat's turn? Oh, is it, what did I do? What did I do here? It's Mr. Shabbat's turn, sir. Okay, I'll continue to exemplify the chairman's uh, <laughs> note that I'm very patient. I, I would look forward to hearing from Mr. Shabbat. And I, I would be happy to defer to Mr. Sherman if if uh, if he'd like to go. I can wait. Go ahead. I've got to prove okay. how patient I am to. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the chairman's uh, generous comment. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I thank the witnesses. I thought this was uh, very uh, very helpful uh, testimony here uh, this morning, or this afternoon rather, and. Uh, so I'll begin, uh, I think, with uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Buchanan. Uh, Dr. Buchanan, um, China has been very active uh, in the Arctic, as we all know, under the guise of uh, investing in research and academic development. Um, what's the likelihood that at least some of uh, these facilities uh, will be used for military uh, and intelligence purposes uh, if they're not already? Thank you for the question. Um, I mean, it's a really important one coming from the South. I mean, we're dealing with the same kind of questions um, in the Antarctic with Chinese interests. I think there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely the case um, that any scientific activity undertaken by China, much like any other Arctic nation really, has the dual use of intelligence collection, intelligence purposes as well. I do believe that the Chinese Arctic interest primarily is about the economic advantages. Um, um, but I also think that there are there are strong kind of climate change and scientific um, windfalls that Beijing is looking to um, exploit in the Arctic. All of those, of course, have intelligence um, aspects to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll go to uh, Mr. Uh, uh, I think Mr. Uh, uh, McElhaney. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. Um, how would you characterize uh, the growing threat of Russian influence in the Arctic? Specifically, uh, what's motivating uh, its buildup uh, along its northern coast, and and uh, how do other nations uh, perceive this buildup? Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I would say the predominant motivator for Russians um, military buildup along its Arctic um, frontier um, are a combination of the massive, um, the massive, massive economic investment Russia has made in the Arctic. Um, you know, with the with the vast majority of its new oil and gas resources in the region um, playing a huge percentage of its GDP, it's only natural that their uh, military investments would go up there. Combined with the approximate 10 to 15 year vacation they took from spending any money um, above the minimum in the region, um, they had a massive infrastructure deficit in the region. So with their investments in oil and gas in the region, they uh, I think it's natural for Russia to to massively increase its defenses as well. Plus, the the opening of the Arctic coast in Russia and the uh, the Arctic Ocean um, creates a new coastline for them. Um, they are also motiv motivated by vulnerability. Uh, any country that had a new coast open would massively increase its coastal defenses, and um, it, it is rational. It's rational for them to do so. Although, of course, their military investments remain, although perhaps, although rational, are still a, a challenge to the United States and its allies. Um, 
That being said, I think other countries bear in mind that this investment is um, is not not unexpected given their oil and gas resources. But I think it also, as you see in t uh, recent uh, U.S. Uh, operations in the Barents Sea just this week, um, need a in kind allied response uh, demonstrating that the that the oceans of the that the Arctic Ocean and the high north are areas where NATO and its members are allowed to operate and are allowed to proactively engage in defensive missions so that they are not um, so that they are not taken advantage of. So you saw, for instance, the Barents Sea operation with the Royal Navy, the United States, and the Royal Norwegian uh, Navy for the first time in a, quite a while. So um, we have a right to defend ourselves and to take appropriate action, and I, I think the, those actions are appropriate. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't really have time to, I think, get into another question to uh, anybody to answer it uh, with the time available. So I'll just raise this, and maybe some other member uh, will bring it up in any event, but that's the icebreakers. Uh, compared to the Russians especially, uh, there's a real capability gap there. I think we have two and three in the offing, but uh, obviously Congress is gonna have to fund these things, but I'd be interested as the testimony goes on to hear about the uh, icebreakers gap. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back since my time just expired. Thank you so much for your questions, Representative Shabbat. I will now ask Representative Sherman to ask his questions. Thank you. Got a few comments to start off with. The first isn't relevant to this briefing, and that is uh, I'm pleased to announce that the State Department inside its building, and I don't know if this announcement, but to be aware of this, is requiring masks of all of its employees. They are having a town hall meeting there tomorrow with uh, Pompeo in their largest auditorium. And I hope very much that the Secretary of State is wearing a mask whenever he's within six feet of any of the uh, employees of the State Department. My hope is the State Department would thereby maybe get the message out to the rest of the federal government. Um, Dr. Herman uh, brought to our attention 101 degree temperatures in the Arctic and uh, told us that uh, what happens in the uh, Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The flip side of that is that what happens in the lower 48 or what happens south of the Arctic affects the Arctic. And it, the vast majority of the carbon, uh, virtually all of it, that is creating this global warming is coming from south of the Arctic. I uh, want to commend those banks that have decided to take a look at the environment before they uh, finance various drilling projects. Uh, so I disagree with uh, Mr. McClaney uh, when uh, he criticizes that. And I want to point out that the administration is trying to, believe it or not, pressure banks to make loans to hurt the environment uh, through the, uh, the OCC, the Office of the Controller. And I hope very much that they're not successful in that. At least we could have as much environmental uh, adv environmentalism from the banks as we get uh, from their uh, decision making. Uh, I'm glad to see that China isn't pushing too hard on this near Arctic idea, because uh, if they're a near Arctic state, so are many other states. Kazakhstan is, is closer to the Arctic, uh, uh, Britain, of course, uh, France has uh, uh, St. Pierre, which is closer to the Arctic, and uh, they're scarcely closer to the Arctic than, than Germany uh, and, and so many other countries. Um, I, we have not ratified UNCLOS. We should. Um, it would give us a lot better tools to use with regard to the South China Sea, and it would give us, uh, uh, it would be helpful to our Arctic policy. I'd point out that in the Arctic, China and Russia's interests actually conflict in that Russia wants all the resources available to those who have coastline and then want to make, wants to make extensive claims, China has in its interest freedom of navigation and access for non-Arctic states or states that don't have the Arctic coastline where Russia happens to be to be able to get relatively close to that coastline. On the other hand, ideologically, China may be with Russia in that China claims huge territories off its coast and might find common ideological cause with Russia claiming huge areas off its coast, all while Russia would want access to the areas off the Russian coast. Uh, 
at a panel discussion at the uh, Winnell, uh, at the Wilson Center, uh, Mr. DeHart, our special representative on these issues, uh, that was a position left open for a couple of years, but we're glad it's filled now, said uh, the people who live in the region are the true stakeholders. Uh, uh, of course, uh, one of the permanent participants in the Arctic Council is the uh, Inuit uh, Circumpolar Council, representing uh, the indigenous uh, Inuit peoples. Uh, Dr. Doro, uh, how would you assess the work of the U.S. coordinator for the Arctic to date in terms of working with Inuit peoples and ensuring that the ICC's voice is heard? Thank you very much for your comments and the specific question. Uh, if I understand correctly, there was a, a recent appointment and uh, to date, uh, we haven't had an opportunity to uh, fully engage in a comprehensive fashion. So I don't have a, a clear and direct uh, assessment or evaluation uh, for you on that count. Um, however, I think what uh, might be useful um, is to uh, possibly dig up and turn to uh, a document that was uh, put in place by the Council on Foreign Relations, Arctic Imperatives, Reinforcing U.S. Strategy on America's Fourth Coast, and some of the recommendations there in if, terms if, of if I can, resourcing if I can the say, U.S. Uh, uh, Doctor, uh, Mr. DeHart has not met with you and the group that you work closely with or represent? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Uh, we have a- his, his comments at the Wilson Center were so overwhelmingly positive. We, I hope very much he tangibilitizes those uh, when he says that uh, I think it's significant that the Arctic Council, in the Arctic Council, the permanent participants uh, sit at the main table and are not in the background with the observers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, and uh, uh, he made it plain that uh, he is, or at least he says orally, he's on your side. So let's yeah. see uh, how hard he fights for the principles uh, that he uh, uh, propounded there. Um, mm -hmm. has, has my time expired? Yes, it has, but you can finish your thoughts. Um, well, I hope very much that the next uh, Senate will ratify uh, uh, the UN account, the law of the sea and uh, UNCLOS, and I hope very much that any administration will involve the Inuit people in uh, mm -hmm. uh, every conference uh, regarding the Arctic. Mm -hmm. uh, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sherman, for your questions. Representative Connolly, if you would like to ask your questions, you could do so now. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Chairman Engel, for having this. I've had a, a long interest in the Arctic. Uh, I had the chance to visit Svalbard uh, several years ago uh, on an environmental scientific uh, visit, and also wrote a white paper two, three years ago for the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, trying to bring more focus on the security aspects uh, of the Arctic. And let me just throw out a couple of observations. One is, I think the United States presence in the Arctic um, is uh, anemic. We are very Alaska focused. The Arctic Circle is a lot bigger than that. Uh, we have almost no capability beyond Alaska. Uh, at Ni Alasun, for example, in Svalbard, uh, the scientific community has begged the United States to have a permanent station there along with many other nations. And yet, Ours is an intermittent presence and very short term. Meanwhile, the Chinese have one of the largest national delegations permanent in the Ellison, uh, which is well into the Arctic Circle. We have almost no search and rescue capability, as Ms. Doro pointed out. So if something goes wrong outside of immediate Alaska, uh, we are completely dependent on the Russians primarily uh, for any kind of search and rescue. And remember, until the pandemic, cruise ships were talking about going into the Arctic Circle. Uh, lots more shipping is going to be coming through the Arctic Circle. And, and, and Ms. Buchanan mentioned that really the Russians don't have expansionist ambitions. Well, if you look at the military buildup uh, along the Arctic littoral by Russia, it's a lot more than protecting, you know, coastal interests. Um, it looks very aggressive. It looks very expansionist. 
uh, it looks very much like a Cold War buildup. And I can tell you, other of our allies in the Arctic Council, like Norway, certainly see it that way. And I think we need to be prudent in monitoring very careful what will the Russians do when they're able to exercise such enormous disproportion of power because we've neglected the Arctic. And finally, with respect to the Chinese, of course the Chinese have economic interests. One of, one of the most important is the cutting the shipping time from Asia to the West. You can cut off, I think, eight days if you can go through the Arctic. So they have a direct economic interest, but they have more than that. You know, Mr. Johnson, you, you talked about China maybe mis, misspoken. A few years ago, as you well know, the Chinese actually explored a proposal to build a brand new uh, town in Greenland and fill it with 15,000 Chinese. That seems to me a very aggressive and assertive Chinese policy that goes beyond monitoring. In fact, it could then give them the right to claim they were in fact an Arctic power because they've got a big station in Greenland. Remember, Greenland only has 50,000 people. 15, adding 15,000 Chinese starts to really change everything about Greenland and has impacts on the indigenous people as well. So those are some thoughts and you're all free to you know, uh, react to them. Uh, but uh, I am concerned about the U.S. posture being so anemic uh, with a very changing Arctic. Mr. McElnany, you were shaking your head. Maybe you want to start. Thank you, sir. Actually, I was, I was, I was looking, looking at my, my family member walking through. I was not shaking my head, but um, I, I will go first. And, sir, uh, thank you. I, I agree with much of what you said. Um, while I, I wouldn't characterize the U.S. capability as anemic, I, I could say absolutely say without contradiction it's in need of uh, massive improvement. Um, and I mentioned the ice breaking memorandum um, and increasing the ability of the United States to operate anywhere in the maritime Arctic, um, not just Alaska. And that, that requires an increase in numbers, full stop. Um, you know, now with the, with the recent accident aboard the Healy, um, you know, the United States is now down to one icebreaker built in the 1970s to maintain its requirements in both the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, that's that's unsustainable. Um, it absolutely needs to be done, and we need a force capable of operations in both the North American, of course, these are my own views, capable of operation in the uh, North American, European, and European Arctic, as well as supporting operations in Antarctica as well. Um, I completely agree with you about, about the threat posed by um, by Chinese um, economic investments, and especially the, especially the threat of using a labor force as a as a bludgeon, um, you know, it it sounds too too horrible to be true, but yet it is a distinct possibility that in, investor that um, northern um, you know northern communities need to keep in mind um, that large projects that don't build up a local indigenous workforce can represent a threat if not carefully monitored and controlled um, so sir i certainly agree with you um, i think that there is an awareness of these challenges though it's not being ignored and i think that um you know i think that with the appropriate investments, we can maintain, can get to a position to better maintain our security and the security of our allies. I would also like to add that search and rescue, in addition to bolstering military capabilities, also requires us to continue to bolster and coordinate with coastal communities who are the first responders in Alaska. Um, and as Dr. Duro pointed out, there is a quite large gap in investment in those coastal communities. So if we are to become an Arctic nation, if we are to truly invest in search and rescue capabilities, as we see increases in shipping, in cruises going through the Arctic, through U.S. waters, we also need to be investing in coastal community infrastructure in case something goes wrong, which includes hospitals, which includes terrestrial transportation, the co-benefits of civilian infrastructure for American citizens in Alaska, in Alaska Native villages, can also help us in our posturing in the North. 
Thanks, Congressman Connolly. Just to jump in here, um, two quick points um, responding to your remarks. From a more kind of pragmatic point of view, if 25% of the Russian GDP requires conflict-free trade routes in the Arctic, um, just in terms of energy security strategy, we know it's as much as about a balance of supply and demand. I think conflict, frankly, is bad for business, um, and that's a priority for the Russian um, economic future. And second of all, just in terms of US policy, I think it needs to be more than reactive to what China and what Russia are doing in the region. It really needs to kind of articulate um, US national interests better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that and characterize it in hockey terms. I mean, the being offensive rather than defensive in terms of the reaction and response. I just quickly wanted to comment on the question about ice breakers. Um, and one of the reasons why I brought up the Council on Foreign Relations um, uh, project the one of the recommendations was the funding and maintaining of up to six icebreakers in the coming decade and also of course having them built in the united states in shipyards but there was an interesting uh, recommendation that emerged in the dialogue about uh, the consideration of creating a cooperative international ice breaking unit with other arctic countries and i don't know how viable that particular option is but i also want to echo the comments that have been made about uh, ratification of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Too often, many focus on UNCLOS specifically because of sovereignty claims. And I think it's important for all of us to remember that there are numerous other chapters that address a whole host of issues that are intersecting, of course, with climate change. I mean, the provisions in UNCLOS that speak to the environment, the marine environment, are quite significant. Um, I also just want to echo the comments that Dr. Herman has just now made about infrastructure and, and, and nearly every uh, panel member speaking to this, whether it's in the context of militarization and defense, but the infrastructure deficit that we face, not just in the United States, but I would I would suggest uh, circumpolar wide, this really does have to be assessed. And to my knowledge, uh, there hasn't been a very clear or coordinated inventory of what exists and what does not exist and the most strategic locations for uh, very practical hardware to respond to uh, any event, whether it is um, uh, the threat of uh, an oil spill, an accident by a, a cruise ship, um, just basic search and rescue. And, and though the Arctic Council has um, a host of working groups, and in particular the EPPR working group, uh, a simple and straightforward inventory would really highlight the the needs that exist. And I just greatly appreciate what Dr. Herman has said about not only in terms of uh, the coastal communities and how to respond to um, uh, surface accidents on the coastal seas and the oceans, but all the other infrastructure deficits that we have faced for decades. And at the outset of my comments, I, I wanted to point out that we live in one of the most affluent countries in the world, and we still have communities without potable water in the Arctic, without proper sewer systems. And this is just stunning. Uh, and, and so we really need to pay attention to some of these very simple, practical, pragmatic uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Connolly, for your questions. Uh, we have enough time, Mr. Shabbat, if you would like to finish your questions from earlier. We have about 10 minutes for you to ask questions, finish off that question if you would like. You're currently muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'd just like to get any uh, commentary relative to the icebreakers um, and, and what uh, what what the uh, witnesses would suggest uh, uh, relative uh, to that. Uh, we have one, I guess, functioning uh, and several that uh, are, are uh, 
uh, we, we will be constructing, hopefully, if, if Congress uh, can get its act together and get the budget uh, uh, done in the, in the near and, and far term. Uh, so just like to hear any comments uh, from any of the witnesses on, on the necessity of, uh, of the icebreakers. Well, sir, I'll reiterate my statement very quickly. I believe it's absolutely essential to recapitalize the icebreaking force of the United States. Um, as you mentioned, you know, being down to one for commitments at both poles is unsustainable. Even with the melting Arctic increase in vessel traffic and economic development will more than more than overmatch the declining ice in the requirement for icebreakers. Um, and that's across the mission set of both search and rescue search and rescue, national security, scientific research, and, and presence, which is a form of, form of all of those put together. Hmm. So the current program of record of three uh, polar security cutters is uh, probably insufficient. I, my personal view is that a force of nine to 10 um, icebreakers with a mixture of heavy and medium icebreakers is absolutely, absolutely essential for the United States. And I believe, um, the memorandum that recently came out kind of encapsulates that in the best way, and I'm hopeful. Hopeful it leads to action um, that can be that uh, Congress can support. Again, my own personal view. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I I would like to make the comment that this this issue also intersects with the. Um, the, the recently adopted and in force IMO polar code and uh, the need for uh, the Arctic Rim states to uh, really belly up and, and, and come to the table in terms of enforcement of the IMO polar code. I think that there are some areas that are a bit inadequate in terms of vessel size uh, as far as monitoring and observations are concerned, but having, uh, having sufficient icebreakers, and I, I would would um, uh, uh, echo the comments just now made about the, the number that are needed and also the weight and everything. But uh, in terms of upholding um, our responsibilities in the context of the IMO Polar Code, that is just one uh, or speaks volumes to just one element of the need for uh, icebreakers. But I also want to point out that here again, the monitoring and observations of our own people, especially active hunters, harvesters, and fishermen, and the role that they can play as the eyes and the ears, uh, as well as the knowledge that they have about the region, their homelands, uh, of which, again, accumulated knowledge over, over uh, centuries, is a significant contribution to this area as well as other areas from climate change to placement of harbors uh, in terms of infrastructure and, and so forth. So I just wanted to make the point about, uh, especially about the IMO Polar Code and the significance of the Polar Code. Thank you. I think Dr. Thank you. might want to weigh in on that. Yeah, I, I would also like to add that icebreakers are critical to U.S. science leadership, right? The Healy mm -hmm. just suffered a fire, can host up to 50 scientists, and those scientists are critical for the U.S. to lead in oceanic research, in atmospheric research, to see what exactly is happening in the high Arctic, how it is impacting the rest of the world, and what we need to do to prepare for climactic changes. Without a strong icebreaker fleet, we are doing our future selves a disservice service by limiting the amount of knowledge that we have access to, by limiting the amount of scientists that have access to the high Arctic and the Antarctic. So increasing our icebreakers is critical, yes, to human security. It is critical to national security, and it's also critical to planetary security if the U.S. is going to lead in a climate change world. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, Representative Chabot, for your questions. And our many thanks again to our briefers for joining us today and to our members for their participation. If you have further questions, please have your staff contact House Foreign Affairs Committee Majority Staff. The briefing is now concluded and all attendees may leave the call. Thank you.